This is Conspiranormal. And uh, so he moved to Nashville back in like, he's gone, long gone from here, but he moved here in like 99 or 2000 and I was friends with him when I was a teenager. Okay. And uh, he showed me all that. He had like all the ski mask tapes and shit. <laughs> and uh, I still actually I got the catalog of the Ski Mask Media Empire sitting right here on my desk. That is incredible. Yeah, so it's, that's crazy. So I kind of I, I almost like when I really realized that I did get a glimpse, kind of into the I guess the darkness that that area breeds. You know, yeah, that, yeah. That time period, and that mythology, that like towpath used and everything, is like you know exactly from the you know which would you experienced i guess and what what's in the the, the graphic novel so that's, that's pretty wild yeah uh those guys were uh man they were famous uh for being like just such a, a shocking group they did they they were you know before you know bands did it with a you know uh, performed with masks and did crazy stuff they would do basement shows and yeah. you know in and like in just small houses and stuff like that and they just had a just a cult following and you yeah. know i mean you can well, look up you can look up their song return to snake land on uh yeah. you know on, on um youtube it's it's, it's there so it's yeah it's one of cr- my friends has that tape there and everything mm-hmm. I ordered some stuff back in the day and yeah they like i guess set shit on fire and stick shit up their butt and all kinds of stuff oh yeah they were nuts, <laughs> they were nuts. yeah and they um uh they, like i said they were famous and then ski mask for like i don't know how long it was but he had like a cable access yeah, show for yeah. a while i had a few tapes of those cable access shows hilarious man uh, they're so bizarre <laughs> so weird it, it, it is so it's like pure surrealness so um he's he's an odd guy you know he really is he just he just uh, i don't know much more about him other than his work and i i've seen him around um but I, you know i'm not gonna be like hey i uh, true this book and you know yeah. he'd, be, he'd be like fuck off <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he seems a little caustic, but but I just yeah. thought that was wild because I I've kind of like uh, I've gotten certain like cultural things passed down from Ski Mask through <laughs> Andrew, and now like this is coming full circle, and I'm kind of kind of getting more into I'm seeing where some of that came from. It's pretty wild. I I love it. I love the connection. I didn't. I wouldn't even think that you guys from down there would have had any connect, connection for that. But that's that is awesome. Um, just to know that some of our culture was imported down there for a minute <laughs> so it's, you know, I, I kind of figure we've already kind of started here with the discussion guys so probably include some of that um, Great. that we just talked about but we've got uh, Aaron O'Brien on the line on Conspira Normal and this is another episode that is kind of uh I guess fallout you could say from episode 300 because as I was assembling episode 300 and asking people what they had any kind of weird stories or anything to talk about um, Aaron got in touch with me and uh, AP Strange got in touch with me (laughs) and I thought both of you guys really just kind of deserve your own kind of show because within the mix of about having like about what was it like 12 people Serfiel, that we had on that episode that was yeah. a crazy episode i listened yeah. to it yeah, yeah. I, I, f- I felt like things we couldn't really do the topics justice on that so i told aaron well let's do our own let's do your own show and uh aaron you're a you're a listener to conspire normal as i found out. i yeah i've been listening to you guys for quite a while i don't know if it was 2016 or 17 i found you guys and i've been listening uh you know i I, you know for for as long as then and uh you guys have gone through some changes but i really like i really really like what you guys have been doing with the show in the last year or so so i think guys have been really kicking it up a bit i love it awesome yeah yeah and it's great content i mean i honestly you guys have some fantastic content awesome yeah that's awesome thank you so much so I, I I am I am honored to be with uh, these two gentlemen. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Well, Thanks, man. Is there anything uh, shows that have like recently that have kind of stood out to you in the recent ones we've done? Well, uh, the one I think that I uh, I pinged you was the one on the uh, cult. I'm trying to remember her name right now. Oh, yeah, um, Naomi. 
Yeah, Naomi. Colton, Thank you. Connecticut. Yes, that was such a crazy story. Um, I, um, I, I just a lot of it resonated with me, and I was just like, man, this is everyone should listen to this damn craziness. So, um, but I, I there's a ton of other stuff that you guys do. I love uh, you know all your um, the UFO stuff, and I love you know the creepy stuff like uh, and uh, like the magic and uh, what was the, uh, the Appalachian um, witchcraft um, stuff yeah. like that? Just yeah. just great stuff. Interest. I would never think of it. Never. It was like it it it. Uh, um, truth is uh, stranger than fiction, so it's it's one of those things. It's so fantastic to hear like what other people are doing, you know, and like, what they're into. So I love it. Yeah, I've been really getting on this whole like folk magic kind of kick lately. Um, awesome, we've had great stuff. Quite a few guys on. Uh, Jake Richards, I think, was the one that you're talking about, and then mm-hmm. also, yeah. um, Tony Kale, who we just had on recently, and Jack Montgomery, who we started out the year with. Um, all those guys, and they're all fairly local to us here, and not not very far away. And they're really uh, been getting into exploring a lot of that uh, kind of interesting folk magic stuff. But uh, you have an interesting story and some insights into some things that I had actually never heard of. But as we kind of talked about in the little cold intro, mm-hmm. um, Sergio actually had heard of some of this before i guess through that band Uh, yeah but you have a graphic novel that is out right now called return to snake land yes and can you kind of tell us like well we'll start out with like how like this project kind of started uh for you like we the i know the the off the um you're the artist and i guess the right correct so kind of came about yeah, so Jason was, um, I didn't know Jason at the time. He, we were, he was writing uh, these, uh, uh, like, blog posts uh, for Return to Snake Land. Um, so I, I should back up just slightly. Uh, Snake Land is a place within the western New York area that was an old abandoned grain silos that kids used to go to party and um, they used to, there was rumors of Satanism, and there was people who died there. So it was just veiled with, um, you know, this dark cloud over it. So it was, there was a lot of um, folklore going around uh, for urban legends and stuff going on with that within the last, you know, 20 some years. And I, uh, I as, a, as a young kid, when I moved into the area, um, I thought it'd be like Indiana Jones and thought it'd be cool to check it out. And um, the place did not disappoint. And so it was one of those places that you just, um, you can't, um, can't forget, you know, it's just, it's amazing. I don't know if you guys have grain silos uh, in your area, but they're enormous structures. Um, they're these giant tubes and they're, you know, you know, hundreds of feet tall and, um, these things were just left abandoned. The police would come and try to chase people away, but I mean, it, all you had to do was hide inside, and they just wouldn't find you. So, and we were teenagers at the time. So, um, when Jason started writing about this, I was like, someone told me, and I was like, oh, that's cool. So I finally got a chance to check it out, and I was like, man, I'm really digging what he's saying because at the time, I was uh, looking for some kind of project to do. And I didn't really know what I wanted to do something with my art. And I, and I'm uh, just uh, always been doing comic book art. And so I decided um, I, he inspired me so much. I thought, yeah, I'll, I'll do just one of his small blog posts on this. I'll, I'll, I'll draw a comic uh, adapt, uh, adaptation of it. And I sent it to him. Did, and I, you know, I didn't have any, um, you know, uh, past relationship with him and he loved it. And he was like, this is great. Um, can you do more? And I was like, uh, maybe, you know, so I started doing some more and start working on stuff. And then uh, we famously met at a bar. We got very drunk and we decided that this was, uh, you know, this is what we wanted to do. We wanted to focus our energy on this. So he had already written a ton on this already. And uh, I, I was just uh, trying to play catch up with the uh, illustration end of it. And... Um, it, it was just, it was, uh, it's been so much fun, you know, um, and um, you're trying to dial back the clock uh, to the 1980s because that's when 
it takes place 1985 1986 period so you're trying to like visually represent it correctly and also you know uh produce maybe i i was trying to produce maybe like a, a, a indie a scene vibe for this uh for this book so i wasn't mm-hmm. i d- wasn't wasn't trying to look make it look slick i was trying to make it look kind of like this is you know like uh you know, uh, somebody did this on a photocopier kind of thing. So uh, that's where I was kind of trying to go for the style uh, of it. So, so yeah, it was just one of those things that was very interesting for me. And uh, strangely enough, um, it's just everything worked uh, with his writing, my drawing style. So, and so this this all revolves around the deaths of eight people right just yeah. within that those couple years yeah i mean um, this is like a relatively small area too so it's it's pretty wild yeah so that's and so jason's the the book itself talks about the content of uh it's sort of semi-biographical of jason's life during that time he's in high school mm-hmm. <clears throat> he's freshman going to sophomore year and he is uh, faced with uh, these these tragic events, and he's trying to make sense out of them in a teenage lens, and that's where I thought was great too. Because especially at the time, I I, I became this uh, just uh, strangely fascinated with uh, the idea of um, the uh, the innocence that we all once had when we were like you know 15 to 16 years old before the crushing weight of life came upon us and we all, you know, had to grow up sure. and it's a magical time because it's like, you know, you, you hear your first song that you totally get into and you're like, this is amazing. I can't believe this song, you know, whatever that one song was, you know, or maybe that one album, uh, you know, you get your first kiss and, you know, maybe getting your first big fist fight, all those things are just like, you know, it's elect- electricity in you. So I was, tr- I was really fascinated with those those moments, and I, I felt that he was touching on that that nerve sort of. And so when I, when I was doing this, I was like, he his story do- is not a linear story. It's it's sort of like looking back at somebody's journals, and and uh, they're they're looking back at a time and trying to make sense of what happened. So the the one of the big focus of the book was uh, there's a uh, uh, there was a girl that lived I'm not lived well lived in the area but uh, sat directly in front of uh, Jason and uh, she was in his homeroom class and she uh, she was murdered uh, on the train tracks right by uh, Snakeland so it was one of those things that was um, really tragic you know and uh the funny thing was it was the 1980s and they sort of had like maybe a 1950s mentality where we just don't talk about these things mm. and um and, he's, and everyone's just like what the fuck just happened you know somebody literally died and all i was told was to move my seat up to the next row you know because she's right. she's longer than you know so there's all these questions and then uh there was a, a, str- a string of suicides, and then uh, a, I believe a close to a year, maybe not even a full year, maybe like uh, six to eight months later, um, there was a young uh, kid who murdered his entire family uh, as they came home, and it was one of his classmates, and uh, you know, murder, murdered his, murdered his uh, younger brother in his room. Uh, killed his mom and killed his dad as they came home from work. And then he got in their car after trying to slit his wrists, and uh, he got in their car and spread, uh, sped down the street and crashed into somebody in front of him and killed that guy. And so when the police pulled him out of the car, the, the wrecked car, he was just screaming like, I killed them, I killed them. And, he, and the guy's like, I know it's not your fault, but he didn't. The cop was like, I know it's not your fault, but not realizing back home he'd killed his entire family. So it, it's horrific. So Jason like was looking at all these experiences and saying, like, what just happened at that period of time? And he um, used the, the idea of Stakeland as a... Um, 
malevolent evil over the whole township and and try and make sense out of it so it's a right. uh, it, there's a lot to go into. It's not. Um, it's not. It's not a simple story. I mean, it, it, the story goes in jags and talks about other things, like talks about sex, talks about uh, drug use and drinking, so all that stuff too. So right, there's a coming of age kind of aspect to to yeah. it, to it in a way as well. And, and this is just for geographical purposes. This is right outside of Buffalo. I'm assuming yes. where this yes, is. Yes, it is. Okay. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say that, you know, that uh, looking into some of the specifics of the cases here, the girl that was murdered, like mm-hmm. we're, we're, let's talk about some of like the like what what really happened and what people think could have happened because I was looking at the website a little earlier and uh there's actually a lot of resources on there for people to see like the that the, know that you guys are just making this out of up on a whole cloth. Like there's you guys got some really interesting resources that say, you know, this actually happened. Um, but I was looking at it, and there was some thoughts that uh, there was another murder much later on, and I guess that that was tied to the to the previous one. Yeah. So there was um, at the t- so it, before this, um, there is a um, there's a person called the uh, he's dubbed here called the bike path rapist. His name is Ant- uh, Antimio Sanchez. And uh, he's a serious a couple people in the area. Um, he's called a bike path rapist because later on there was a couple uh, people that he would um, he would rape, and some did die in uh, on this uh, specific bike path. And um, he uh, his his signature was uh, using uh, like a a, a garrote or groat to uh, strangle somebody. So he had a, a wire that you pull around their neck. So, unfortunately, uh, he started uh, way before this, and it, it's a it's, actually it's extremely interesting um, story that's behind him. How the police actually caught him because he was a um, uh, he was linked to so many different uh, cases, spreading almost I, I'm going to say close to 25 to 30 years. That's how long he had been working in this area, and the and the strangest part about him is that uh, they nobody knew uh, his like his whole family. He's like he was a normal, you know, taking his kids to you know softball practice and you know part of the community, and everyone was completely dumbstruck that this guy was doing this. So. Yeah, it was it was just one of those things that was nuts that nobody could have thought this was this guy was capable of this. So here's somebody in just a neighborhood doing this stuff, and so um, Sanchez, you know, worked literally uh, probably less than a mile away from where uh, the girl was uh, was was killed. So it was. Um, and she was strangled too, just like the way uh, he he had strangled. Now, as far as I know, um, she wasn't raped, um, but of course I don't have any, uh, you know, I I don't have like the police files or anything like that, so I wouldn't yeah. know. Yeah. You know. So. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but it's um, it's one of those things that were you know, um, it's hard to not see the connection, but. My only real thought between, uh, you know, Sanchez and and her death is that they caught him on all these different, uh, you know, different rapes and also these different murders. And how come this one was not connected? And part of me wonders if maybe it wasn't. And I, I I've done some more digging. And and so is Jason as well, and we have found uh, some other connections that might be just as interesting too, um, but they're even harder to prove. So mm-hmm. um, there's there's a theory that uh, I, I'm not um, I'm not going to give away names just because there's no way to prove these things. But um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But there was uh, basically three uh, young men that were a little bit older. 
that were uh, around the area, especially partied in the Snakeland area, and that one of them had been dating uh, her, what we call her in the book uh, Hannah Grab Graber, but um, they had been dating her, and she had broken up with them. And uh, the thought is that they'd seen they'd seen him stalking her. And at one point uh, later on that they were, were wondering if these, there's, there's a bunch of internet chatter about all this. I've done tons of research on this. And that these three uh, older boys might have got a little too rough with her and, and started serious. So that's, that's just one theory that's out there. We don't have any way to prove it. And unfortunately, I don't know if uh, this case is so old that they don't have DNA evidence that can connect them. So, yeah. What's so that's that. Yeah. Well, go ahead. Go ahead. No, it's just one of those things. Like I, I just feel like if the district attorney prosecutes, you know, uh, Sanchez, the bike path rapist, for all these things, why didn't he go after this too? That would be just another feather in a cap. Here's an unsolved murder yeah. that that was not uh, connected here, and that I, it does have strong resemblances to how he did things but why wasn't it connected and why wouldn't sanchez just admit to it at this point you know they got him for everything else he's going to jail for the rest of his life he's never coming out right and the, so. the feeling that possibly that they wouldn't have enough to pro probably even convict him on it or the case was so old that they just didn't care i mean that's that's another another possibility too yeah Sometimes that is that is into that that's extreme. That's exactly uh, true. That could very well be. Um, there was um, uh, in f what what f what was really great about uh, when they caught him was uh, that there was um, a, a great investigator that went looking through all this stuff and cleared uh, a, another young man who had uh, for a, a, a past murder. His name was Capozzi. He was uh, he was basically at the wrong place at the wrong time, and he got blamed for a uh, a murder that uh, Sanchez did. And because of um, the police work, they were able to actually clear this guy's name. Unfortunately, the poor composed guy was in jail for almost twenty some years. Yeah, that's so. A, that's a far too often occurrence. Right. Mm. Exactly. So you hear about you hear about stuff like that all the time, unfortunately. Well, I was going to ask really kind of like what's the the role of this like rumor in a lot of this and kind of like yep. conflation and people you know not remembering things correctly. Yeah. Like you know, do you think that the, and especially I guess in the way that uh, you know, it's kind of portrayed in the graphic novel, you know, whether some of that is some of this, the way that it's kind of is a nonlinear approach, or whether that maybe some of that is kind of conveyed a little bit in the graphic novel that that kind of yeah. like, kind of like the the fallibility of memory. Absolutely, that's you can't. There's no getting around that. I mean, and we're talking about something that happened, uh, you know, over twenty five, almost thirty years ago. Yeah, I mean, actually, probably more now. So, um, a lot of people don't remember things right. Uh, they remember certain things, but they don't they're unclear about details. So, um, so when we're talking about this, unfortunately, this is a very old case. I, you know, it's like hard to know who's going to remember what and who, what, what's uh, what's true and what's not. Because obviously, yeah. even even any of us with our memories, we can think of something that happened 15, 20 years ago and think back like, oh, wasn't that pleasant? day or something like that and you might just be putting your own thoughts of what happened and maybe you don't see everything uh you're not seeing everything as it really was you know you kind of like change the events because you had a good memory or a bad memory or something to that nature so um yeah and and as for jason's writing the the fragments are looking back purely in his perspective so he you know he doesn't uh, doesn't try to come up with any answers. He's just kind of like telling you what he experienced, how he felt at those times, and um, how it feels to him now. So uh, that's it. Great. Makes me wonder whether, mm -hmm. because this is the height of the satanic panic, and not only that, but there was you know this really strong local metalhead culture that was just exacerbating that. Yeah. Um. If it if it made it harder to actually find the killer or killers, because of all this 
rumor mill of satanic cults, etc., that have made it, you know, more than what it might have been. Mm-hmm. And whether that just, you know, occupied, it made so much noise that it was harder to actually find the killer. Yeah, and there's there's a lot of that, too. So, I mean, of, of course, there's, uh, you know, people just hanging around, partying, you know, drinking, smoking pot, and, you know, listening to too much Black Sabbath, and, you know, wanting to, you know, wanting to live that life, you know. Um, which is cool, of course, but, you know, um, but doesn't mean you are, you know, sacrificing people or anything like that. But, you know, the flip side of it is that you're, um, there are people who, you know, probably get around to those areas and they're like, hey, maybe I can, you know, uh, take advantage of certain things here. So, um, <clears throat> I mean, that's a possibility. Uh, and if there were real Satanists, I... I have a hard time believing that they were like hardcore Satanists. I, I've heard reports uh, that there was actually um, Satanists that would like, you know, march down the streets and stuff like that. I, that uh, this is things I've, I've heard. I this is, you know, before my time, you know, so I would have been too, too young to have, to have uh, register all this, but this is what people are saying that they were literally rumor yeah. and all that. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, pure rumor. So, well, I mean, this is this is the time period where you've got um, you're right, right in the middle, probably like eighty five, eighty six. That's probably like the depth of the satanic panic, if you really want to think about it. I mean, you've got like uh, Gerardo Rivera's, you know, yep. sat- uh, the ar- in the arms of Satan or whatever it was called. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> that still, no, that you can still find on YouTube was was very much out there, and. Yep. Um, you know, this is the time where all the heavy metal guys are getting getting in trouble because kids were kill, trying to kill themselves or listening to heavy metal albums. And, th- you know, this and of course, this all kind of culminates in stuff like the West Memphis Three. But, yeah, I mean, this is just like the role of that, I think, is very important and very central to your graphic yeah. novel. So I kind of want to get your kind of thoughts on that. Just to say, well, we even mentioned in the in the graphic novel the McMartin Spree School. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, just, I mean, it's a blur, but I mean, it's like, yeah. I mean, was um, I, I'm not actually even a, a, a you know what what I can tell um, modern practicing Satanists. Um, I don't believe that have any connection to what's going on here in this story. Um, I think. Uh, there could be maybe some nefarious groups of uh, people that might have been just using that as a veil to act, even you know, you know, as as a, a terrible person. Yeah. Um, but um, that being said, yeah, there was the satanic panic, um, and unfortunately, uh, that these kids were, like I said, listening to you know their Ozzy and everything else, and and they're just spray painting pentagrams on the walls of Snake Clan, and they you know writing Satan in six 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 was not helping locals feel any yeah. safer. <laughs> you know, right. I mean, it, it's um. It's it's one of those places that I I um, I love I love the idea. It's this in between place, this abandoned place that like mm-hmm. everyone's forgotten, and yet it's this um, huge looming like evil castle. I mean, um, I like I said, I uh, these grain elevators are enormous. They, you you cannot miss them. They are like a giant. They're like a giant. Like I'm not gonna say skyscraper, but you know. Easily uh, an eight foot, ten foot uh, building, if not taller. And um, in in this in the Buffalo area, we've come to a point where we've uh, realized that they um, have a like an architectural significance, and people actually enjoy them. As, as we're like you know putting bars in them now, now and stuff like that. This was actually one that they thought was so bad they demolished. You can actually look up. Um, this, you know, uh, like uh, demolition or destruction of snake land on, on YouTube and watch it actually get blown up. So, I mean, this was like a scary place for a lot of locals. Uh, yeah. um, the kids, though, this was a place to have a lot of fun. Yeah. And um, it was so that's the cool side of it. But also like the Satanist side is like I, I so I had been to the very top of, of uh, one of what they call. Uh, uh, the top of Snake Land was called this s- small short room called the Midget Room. Uh, it was literally the ceiling was maybe 
five foot is you like you had to bend down be in this room and on the floor was an enormous pentagram in like some wax or congealed uh you know material and there was tons of you know uh you know satanic you know uh like spray paint and stuff like that something was happening people were doing some kind of satanic uh, um worship um that doesn't happen just over nothing for for nothing you know people were doing things and most metalheads kind of like take a lot of it with a grain of salt, but I mean, I gotta say, I mean, it's to be honest, there is some real, you know, dark mysticism that a lot of kids do get really into who are really into heavy metal. Uh, I mean, I've I've been around that, and it does turn into, uh, you know, potentially criminal things. Sometimes it it happens. Like it's, yeah. there's no doubt that it it has happened a lot. You know, just like any subculture, you know, we're not trying to blanket everybody, but it exists. There, there's there's definitely that that definitely exists. Yeah, and I yeah I, I would like to say that I don't believe that most Satanists would do anything that that terrible. But I you know people get out of control, and especially with drugs, drinking, and whatever else is happening, who knows? You know. Well, things- it's- it, it's also too like you know a lot of kids that are you know that are I don't want to talk about these suicides that you talk about in the um, in, on the website, but a lot of these kids they a lot of kids will will get involved with the subculture or whatever and maybe they'll listen to something that's like essentially negative and they're negative to begin with and then they can just go be negative with each other and you know eventually that can influence some pretty bad shit. Yeah. Yeah, and it definitely has like a, a warrior cult element to heavy metal subcultures. Like right. absolutely, I think I think it really does um, pull on you know something really primitive, and that's why it's it's uh, you know so it's so popular. Also, you know, people really do feel it. You know, especially young men, especially teenagers. Yeah. Um, you know, and I think it can it can really you know. If you don't know how to process that, if you're not, you know, intellectual enough, a lot of times it can get really antisocial. Well, I, I think, I, I, I think, I think in recent years, sorry, Aaron, uh, in recent years, the metalheads have become more like, you know, the, your lovable uncle now. There's yeah, like yeah, softening yeah. Of, that, of that. There's been a softening of how they are, you know. Sure, sure, yeah. No, that's true. And I uh, just to add to that is just that, yeah, I think. I think we've all been uh, at that point that, you know, 15, 16 year old listening to some really dreary music in your room and feeling like, oh, man, my life sucks, you know, and not realizing that you got basically the whole world in front of you. It's, you know, you're 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 hormonal, you're changing, your life is changing, uh, your dynamics in life are changing. You're noticing girls or, or girls noticing boys or maybe boys noticing boys or whatever. But you're all you're coming to these uh, realizations, and you're just like, "What do I do with all this?" It's very confusing. And if you go back to like I'm saying, like this, these are the 1980s, and this uh, the the neighborhood, the township here, very like 1950s, where things just aren't discussed. You know, maybe some families they were, but I don't think a lot were. And so a lot of things get like we don't talk about. You know, uh, we don't talk about girls, or we don't like they have that awkward sex talk. You know, uh, just don't do drugs. Drugs are bad. Like, okay, thanks. Right, thanks, right. thanks, Dad. You know, kind of thing. So uh, it's um, it's it's uh, it's definitely a confusing time. And like you're saying, if you're in that dark place and you can't process it, and you don't have any kind of real support at home or or the correct support to help you, you're lost. And maybe yeah. um, you know, maybe uh, suicide seems like a viable option. Unfortunately, you know, this is it did happen with some of these people that, you know, Jason encountered and was part of his life. At point, so. Well, and, and youth culture was really, you know, like kind of an American creation. Um, and when this when these youth cultures kind of got created, even if you go back to like, you know, 1950s greaser movies, you know, kids are always trying to get like outside to these liminal places you know yeah. some abandoned place or you know these places attract teenagers uh, they're often abandoned and because they're abandoned and from some past time like a you know different economic era or something they're like a canvas to project all this mythology around because you don't really you know, they probably didn't really understand where it came from so like you know they get to to put their whole mythology around it and it's just really interesting i just i don't know if something like that's going to happen 
again or if that even like happens anymore with with kids now um yeah yeah that's a good point i think a lot of unfortunately i think uh social media um has made it very easy for people to stay home and interact with each yeah. other before it was like you know i'll meet you outside at the fence at so and so time you know and you know hopefully they didn't stand you up and these kids are like they're 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 looking for you know congregation and and some kind of i mean it's crass but they really are looking for some type of initiatory experience you know it, it's dionysian it's you know there ah, there's love something ancient yeah, there there that. definitely is something ancient that they're like they're trying to find that they're pulling on and especially when they're isolated from adults in their own little world with their own little you know thing going on it's just it's pretty it's pretty interesting i i, I saw some of the Europe really came of age turn of the century, and I, I still there was still remnants of that. Like I remember when we'd go out exploring things, seeing that old graffiti from like the earlier '90s and stuff, and the mm-hmm. old satanic graffiti, and just having the sense of oh wow, we're in the same thing that like the generation right before us was doing. Like, right. Right. and it's almost like a chain. There, yeah, you know that's how it was for me. I remember in high school of just being like you looked up to the older kids. They were maybe only like two or three years older than you, really. But you look, you looked up to the older kids, and it was like something was being passed down to you, and then you would pass that down to somebody else. You know, yeah, there was yeah. that. There was that kind of uh, that kind of chain of like the like the, the, the your little clique. That's how the clique was able to sustain itself. Uh, but the, the social media stuff now, I mean, it's got its own set of problems and its own. Oh, of course. Of and it's, yeah. You know, um, but the, the suicides also that are happening around the same time. Um, mm-hmm. What was kind of the link of those to those? They were thinking there was some link to, to snake land and that these kids were all hanging out there and that's what was happening. And Well, I mean, it's, 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 so that's the thing is like, we just don't know. And, uh, Jason's done a ton of research trying to find out information on, on those suicides, but unfortunately, um, not a lot is, is, is out there. Um, uh, and the idea is that he felt that there's a connection because of the evilness that was happening during that time. And, um, and just as well as the um, the young kid who killed his whole family and then accidentally killed that other guy in his car, uh, you know, um, when he did that, I mean, his home is like you could see Snake Land down a street. You could literally walk like three blocks and you'd be in Snake Land. That's how close it was. Um, and so it was just like there was just it, what what Jason's trying to construct here is the idea that. You know, maybe it wasn't necessarily Snake Land, but there was some kind of like dark cloud over all this, and it's like, what was it? You know, what was it? Is it just because we are at a time of history where we just didn't talk about things? Now, now today, where you know, parents try to have very open conversations with their kids. Back then, it was like, yeah, I don't want to know. <laughs> I'm I'm watching Archie Bunker right now or whatever you know so like you know I don't need to watch I don't need to talk to you about this you know kind of I'm, thing so I'm curious about what what was the economic conditions at the time is it still pretty industrial is there still a lot of jobs is it, 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 the 80s um, you know the Buffalo area was waning uh, we still had a strong steel industry here on Lake okay. Erie um, but those jobs were kind of going away slowly I mean the Japanese steel was coming in. Um, unfortunately, uh, we, uh, the green and, uh, cement shipping over the lakes, they used to have the big boats that would take them across to Chicago. And was, that kind of was getting subverted because we had trains and we had, uh, you know, the interstate. So we still have those, we still have those giant grain ships come through, but not to the level they had probably back in the sixties and fifties, um, or, yeah. or before. But so we, we were, uh, like a, a, a hub port to going to the Midwest at one point, and that had uh, started to slow down. So we were at this point where things are slowly changing, you know, and we did become a depressed economy. We became part of that Rust Belt kind of thing yeah. uh, for a little bit. So uh, fortunately, as of now, things are a little bit on the upswing. Um, we, we're seeing, uh, some changes in the area, but during that time, I think it was on the, it was becoming on the downswing. It wasn't terrible, but it wasn't like the nineties. It got really, really kind of glum. So, 
Um, but it was uh, it, the mid '80s. Things were still okay, you know. We'll talk about too a little bit of that because you you guys convey this in the graphic novel this this feeling of just like hopelessness and like what uh, some of the some of the fears that were going around in the mid '80s that you know this could be the the, the last generation and. Right. I think he does pretty. One of the segments in the book, you guys do a pretty good job of, of saying like you know the what is really kind of feeding into this is the economic situation, but also some of the hopelessness and some of the fears that are going around at the same time. Yeah, well, we had uh, obviously looming uh, death from above by uh, nuclear war. I mean, yeah. we don't think about it as much, but um, but you know the Soviet Union and you know the United States were deadlocked you know with you know thousands of missiles pointed at each other and it would have just obliterated the whole world i mean we still could obviously but um it was that was uh, a scary point and it and honestly it was always on your mind it was like not like something you thought every minute passing minute but you're like you know we could all just die of you know of nuclear holocaust uh, so that was always there. Um, we had the emergence of AIDS, uh, so that was terrifying, and uh, nobody knew what to think of that at the time. So um, that was just coming around, uh, <laughs> and then, and then with that, um, you know, you have just basically a, a difference in culture. You know, I, I, you know, we think about the '90s and the 2000s, and you know, and forward. You know, things have changed quite a bit, like the acceptance of, uh, you know. Uh, of people who are of different sexual persuasion or or even dif- even color or, or or ethnic background you know this this time period people just did not accept those things or not as easily i'm not saying yeah. not everybody but it was there was a there was a, definitely walls that were put you know there was redlining in communities and there was definitely exclusion and you know you know, son of mine is going to date another man kind of thing. You know, that, that stuff happened. You know, it, it was, it was real. It was very real. And it was, it was, it was enforced. Nobody went like, oh, you can't do that to that person. No. It's, and the people was like, yeah, hell yeah, do that to that person. So, I mean, they weren't, at least we weren't like, you know, uh, as bad as like, you know, uh, you know, lynching people and, and beating people up, but not to say it never happened. You know, so this was, there was all this, like, ugliness under uh, a glossy exterior making everything look great. And uh, I think all that feeds into your psyche. And I think you know that you're, uh, that as a teenager, too, especially, I think as a teenager, you say, like, all this bullshit. You know, like, how is this, how is this living? You know, I see my parents going to work every day. They're miserable. I have threat of nuclear war. There's disease. There's all sorts of other things going on that are not right. And you see it. Like, we become, as older you get, you become accustomed and go, well, that's the world, kid. What are you going to do about it? You know, back then, like, when you're 17 years old, you're like, fuck that, dude. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I'm just trying to figure out where where the... Well, we do, but (laughs) you come to acceptance, I can't change the world, I think, so... I'm just kind of trying to get a a grasp on uh, where this this real sense of a constricting culture comes from, because, you know, we're, like, I can understand it here with maybe, like, a small town, real evangelical, that type of thing, but is this, like... Is this just was this a byproduct of like the industrial society, like the conformity, and the do you just get the sense of like this constricting society that these kids felt? I think that's just a period which you got at that time. I think people were like, yeah. you, you know, you you get out of high school, and you're going to get a job in a factory, or maybe if you're lucky and smart enough, you'll go to college. Um, and this is your lot in your life. You'll get married probably when you're in your like, uh, you know, twenties and you're, you know, women were supposed to obviously have kids, um, you know, maybe a short career, but you know, I mean, there was, it was very different, you know, honestly, it was just a different thing. It's, it, it's hard to imagine because life has changed quite a bit. Um, and it's, uh, people, you've seen people kind of break out of those roles and, 
you know, some of it's, I would say, for the better. I mean, there are some drawbacks here and there once in a while. You know, I think we were talking before, you know, like young people don't have like that, uh, they're looking for that coming age or something to challenge them. And I don't think young people have that anymore. I think, um, you know, uh, you look in the early tribal societies, so like the hunters would take the young men out and, you know, teach them to hunt and scare the, the crap out of them by doing these, like, crazy rituals and stuff like that to make them men, you know. Um, unfortunately, we'll just always be women because biologically that's they, they don't have a choice in the matter. They just become women. So um, I think it, during that time period, you're just like you're forced into a role that maybe you weren't ready for or maybe you didn't want to do. You know, maybe you wanted to not work in a factory job and you wanted to do something else. So... Um, I think there was an abrasion. And I think we saw that too in the nineties. We saw so many like pushback on all that stuff in the nineties that, you know, you had like, you know, all the, 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 the punk grunge rock thing exploding and stuff like that, that people were like saying like, you know, this is all bullshit. Let's change it. You know, um, whether it did, that was anything or not, I don't know. But I, I think there was a, a, the set standards for so long, you know, for, I mean, since the Industrial Revolution into that time period. So I, that's, what I, that's why I think the culture existed, and that's why it was still mm-hmm. there. And, and obviously there's a religious component. You know, um, the Buffalo area, West New York area, extremely Catholic. Yeah, um, that's what I heard. You know, and, you know, there's, I mean, there's other uh, belief systems too, but, I mean, it was very, very, um, you know, they had very strict ideas of what, what you can and cannot do. So. Yeah. The the kid that killed his, his entire family, what uh, what was the further story on that? Like what happened with him? So he, so his name was John Justice. Uh, he actually um, he basically came home. Uh, he I guess he was a very promising student. He was very bright, and his his mom and dad both work. I think his his mom was a nurse or or worked some late shift. So does his dad. And he was he was uh, kind of talking about that constraint of what was going to happen to his future. He wanted uh, to um, go to college, and the teachers in school were like, "Hey, you got a bright kid here. He really could do well in, in life." And unfortunately, his parents were like, I, "I don't have any money to send you to college. You ain't going to college." And this was before there was like easy accessible. You know, just to pay for tuition, uh, like, you know, uh, st- st- Stafford loans and, you know, all the other stuff you can get into. So I think it was a little more difficult just to get into college. And they were like, you're, you're probably not going to go to college, kid. So he was disgruntled. Then he started getting into subculture of, like, you know, certain kind of punk. And unfortunately, it seemed like he was getting into stuff that was, like, um, very, uh, like, you know, right-leaning Nazi <laughs> punk scene. Oh, man. Yeah, so he was getting into some of that stuff. Uh, and I, I think the idea was, like, one of it was he bought the uh, album cover, or the album uh, Spinky Glish or, or Die. I forgot the name of the... S.O.D. Uh, the, yes, thank you. Uh, so he bought that, and he was listening to that. So he, he just he got into a weird, dark place in his head. And I guess at some point, he decided he was going to uh, take out his family because they were the one holding him back and the source of his misery. So uh, when he was home alone with his brother, one to his, uh, snuck up on him and uh, you know hit him over the head and killed him uh, instantly. His mom came home from uh, came home from work and he uh, uh, you know stabbed her. Uh, down in the basement and then he went to go pick up his father from work picked him up and once he came home he killed him immediately too and then he uh slit his own wrists and uh that's when he, unfortunately he did not die of suicide and he decided he got in the car and he because of blood loss and he's just probably in complete shock of everything he rammed into a back of a, uh, a car and uh and killed the, the driver in front of him. So he killed him as a, you know, was a totally uh, unexpected thing to happen. So, it, uh, yeah. It, is he still alive? Is he still around? Yes. 
he's still around. He was released from prison uh, at some point, and I think um, just recently, I, I think he was having a hard time adapting, and he was uh, put back in prison for uh, for some time. I don't know where it is right now if he's still in or out, but John Justice was uh, um, was released for a bit, but I, I, he couldn't adapt. He, I mean, you figure he was a teenager like maybe 17 and just was in prison forever. So he was probably in his mid thirties by the time they let him out. Jeez. So and, and the, yeah. th- there's a weird postscript to that because the guy that got killed in the car, mm-hmm. there was the, the, some kid got the cornea transplant from. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I guess I guess something worked out a little bit. Um, although it's a it's a steep price to pay, but yeah, I mean it, it's it's one of those things that just like defies like logic. And like I said, from Justice's house, you you walk down the street and and you could see Snake Lane. In fact, uh, the, the the night that uh, Hannah Graver you know was killed i mean she was in the park that was across the street partying with her friends and then they went down to snake land a little later that's how it was rumored to go so uh, you know it's just it's the connections are so odd you gotta wonder what was going on these two towers that just kind of loom over Mm -hmm. the city yeah it's Mm -hmm. interesting imagery um turning to another topic you were you also wanted to mention some things about you when we were first corresponding about like the Jehovah's Witnesses too. Oh yes, yeah, I grew up as a Jehovah's Witness, yeah, and uh, yeah, like I said, that when we had you, you had that um, uh, podcast um, with the cold. I was like, holy crap! I mean, that was extremely intense, but very relatable, um, uh, like story, and. Uh, you know, I felt like you guys should definitely take maybe a someday do an episode just on the witnesses because they seem, you know, I mean, like a normal religion, maybe a little odd because they go knocking on doors and now they've been doing a lot of these, like they set up billboards and, and with their magazines and on street corners and stuff like that or parks or public places. But um, they have you know, all these bizarre beliefs of, um, you know, Armageddon happening and, um, you know, the idea that they've made, they made a ton of predictions of when Armageddon was going to happen and that it never did. And uh, you're, these people are always living in fear that if they break out of all this, that Armageddon, they'll die by the hand of God. And um, it's, it's even further enforced because if you... Uh, dissent in any shape or form, or even disagree, or just say, I don't want to do this anymore, you are shunned completely by your fr- friends and family that you grew up in, grew yeah. up with. Mm. So, yeah. um, I I'm, um, haven't technically, biblically did anything wrong, but uh, I am currently being shunned by my family because oh, I don't, yeah. I, uh, I just don't want to go to their church anymore. That's all it really comes down to, and um, I, um, it's it's difficult. I, my younger brother, I should make that caveat. My my younger my youngest brother does doesn't shock me. Me and him talk pretty regularly on the phone. He lives out in Washington uh, State, but um, yeah, but we you know, but we definitely know that things are definitely messed up, and um, so with that on top of it, I was lucky enough that you know I got married, I had a family. Um, I have a full life, but there are a lot of people that that shunning completely devastates. Like they have nothing left, and they have to try to find their way. And it's and some of it's not even like, like what happens if you know you're gay, and you just they don't accept gay people into their their their, their religion. You can't you can't date a, another man. You can't date another woman. Uh, th- this is not accepted. So what happens then? You know, like you're going to just change yourself. So. Um, these people have to rebuild their entire lives. And it, yeah, I, I'm in the sincere belief that uh, there's they're, they're blood guilty just on many suicides 
of course, I have no way to put those together, you know, numbers wise. But I'm sure if you look back at uh, a lot of these ex witnesses, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses that were shunned, that there could be a lot of people who, uh, uh, that just decide that living was worth living anymore. Um, on top of that, they also have a, a ban on using blood transfusions, um, mm. which I, I've known at least two people uh, that in my past, uh, you know, my, that I went to uh, the church with them that they had passed away because of illnesses and maybe the blood transfusion wouldn't save them completely, but I know that it led to factors of their deaths. So there's, there's that on top of that. And then uh, in addition, you have this bizarre cover up of child molestation within the organization. I was about to bring that up. Actually, It's yeah. this, this, this bizarre biblical thing of you need to, ac- to accuse somebody of any crime within the, the Jehovah's Witnesses uh, church, you have to have at least two witnesses to say, yes, they did this. Well, child molestation is obviously, unless you're in some kind of pedophile ring, there nobody's seeing, seeing this. That, that sounds almost like that's set up. To, oh, it's, it's to, so to freaked do that. out. I know, and then on top of that, the you know uh, the the church leaders have done everything to suppress it. And if you you can go down a rabbit hole, uh, probably five miles deep with uh, ch- child molestation and Jehovah's Witnesses, it is it is an enormous problem. I I've known at least within my own church, there was at least three people I know that or victims and things that happen within there. I can't prove it. There's nothing I can do about it because it's just hearsay. But um, it's 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 a it's a problem that like they need to uh, come clean about. It's just just change your policies. It's not a good policy. It, it's you know even the Catholic Church is is you know they shuffle their their priests and bishops around so you know they don't get but they are slowly i think coming around to some of it i don't think it'll happen anytime soon but i think they're realizing that this they have a huge problem especially yeah, in new york problem. new york state has uh has a um uh the child victims act which is there's no statutes of limitations now so uh, Joe's Witnesses are in trouble, Catholic Church, um, there's uh, other organizations that are just uh, facing those things. Uh, I know uh, Pennsylvania is doing the same thing. Um, so there's, there's a lot of uh, action, and it really comes down to a lot of these ex-witnesses that were shunned and are treated like garbage for so long um, are, are becoming activists to either change the organization or stop their terrible practices. Yeah, there's so, a, there was a uh, documentary series about cults that I watched, and the one that was about the witnesses, they uh, that was the primary focus was the sexual abuse. And this one lady that she had been sexually abused when she was a child, and uh, nothing was ever done about it. And just yeah. you know, uh, she's uh, she even goes so far as to like actually go to. And I think the center is up there in New York, isn't it? Is it the so the the, the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society yeah. has uh, has uh, there there was the infamous uh, infamous <laughs> or popular um, uh, sign that said Watchtower on in Brooklyn. They had bought, especially back in the sixties and seventies, when those properties were like worth nothing. They bought a ton of those properties, and they they fixed them up. Um, they they have basically uh, if you work for the uh, full time for um, the the Jehovah's Witnesses, um, you're kind of taking a vow of uh, poverty, like you're, you're like a, a monk or something. You're, you're not a monk. You're you're just it's the type type of thing that you're not getting paid anything. And th- they got all these people to fix all these properties up, and they've uh, sold most of it now, and they've moved up to a place called Wallkill, uh, and they built a brand new. Uh, facility up there and they've sold most of those because now Brooklyn is like it's like on fire you know real estate wise so they've made a uh, you know a, a small fortune on all of those built they've they've just sold so yeah I it, you know it, it I, I'm, I'm kind of torn on them because there's a certain some certain things with them that are just like uh, I have a little bit of sympathy you know a mm. lot of the um, and the only reason really is because two things. A lot of the reasons, like historically, 
Uh, there was uh, a lot of the reasons we have a lot of the free speech rulings that we have today were because of the Jehovah's Witnesses. And like the 30s. They're, they're pacifism, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's what a lot of that had to do with. And then, of course, you know, historically also, there's the fact that, you know, uh, they were they were put in they were put into concentration camps by Hitler, you know, so there's some a little bit of sympathy. But um, what same, you might not know is that the, the oh, sure. But what you might but what you might not know is that that the leader at the time of the Jehovah's Witnesses uh, organization actually uh, made overtures to Hitler right. to, to, to try to uh, become in good graces before. Hitler, you know, totally went nuts and started putting people in concentration camps, and and that's been documented as well. Mm. Um, so, yes, I mean, the you know, Holocaust uh, and you know, the witness, the Jehovah's Witnesses were obviously uh, put in those concentration camps. Tragic. I'm not not going to even you know. There's nothing to say that makes it right. Um, and I honestly, if you talk to any Jehovah's Witness in your daily passing, they're usually very sweet people. They're very kind mm-hmm. people. Oh, There's yeah. I, 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 nothing bad to say about an individual. I'm talking about the organization. Right. And the sad part is, is that if those people want to dissent or if they just say, I just don't want to do this anymore, they, uh, they really, uh, a, a, a you know, a wall of uh, problems. You know, either they they get back in line and go, you know, do do what they're being told, or you know, you face the consequences. And I'm sorry, I just don't think you should be. You know, if you just don't believe anymore, let them go. What's right. what's the big deal? You know, right. and yeah, it's 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 threat it, by threatening to take your family. You know, way take it, take brothers and sisters and friends you've had for years. You know, it's that's like the very definition of a cult in and of itself. You know, and that's kind of where I was going with that. Just that, um, it's the organization and and holding these organizations accountable for stuff that they have that they have either done themselves or b have have helped to, to cover up. I mean, they need to be held accountable for all this. You know, like in Naomi's story, they were basically using people as slave labor. Yeah. That group. Yeah. Well, like, and think about it. It's Joe's like witnesses. Illegal. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. But I mean, Joe's witnesses, like I said, they, they uh, used their people. I mean, they willingly went, of course, but they, to volunteer and work in these, uh, you know, to either, during the time of like the 60s and 70s when they were pumping out you know uh watchtower and awake magazines and uh, whatever books they were coming out at the time they were you know ran giant printing presses to do all that free labor you know just paying for materials right <laughs> and, and and machine costs for printing presses uh fixing up these buildings uh free labor you know just materials new drywall new paint new windows or whatever but you know that's expensive of course but you know labor is a huge chunk of anything you do so oh, yeah. um uh, you know look that's your choice if that's what they want to do but if someday you say you know what this is not working for me you know like we should be able to leave without any kind of um uh, any kind of uh, you know fallout from it and you, you know you um in the uh, the side of it too that uh, I, that's a a big issue is these people that work for the organization full time and spent 30 years 40 years working for them once they leave there's no pension there's no old folks home i mean the catholic church at least takes care of their priests and their nuns when they retire they put them in you know, uh, retirement homes that, that they care for them. There's nothing. These people just go home and it's like, figure it out. Have yeah. fun. You know, you're 60 some years old, you know, hope you work it out. You didn't put anything into your social security or even a 401k. So, I mean, it's, there's some, I, I don't know. I just, I have a lot of issues and it's, it's, it's not the problem with the witnesses is that it's not nefarious enough to make you go like, well, they should just be cl- shot down completely. But it's it's just they do all these just nuanced things that are just like that's not right. You can't do that to people. Well, let so me ask you this uh, here's because um, you know the Mormons used to be considered a cult, yeah, and now they're very very mainstream. And 
do you think that that, that there's there's that becoming maybe that acceptance of the witnesses that they're kind of like you know, like we're that we they're, they're like well maybe we're just as mainstream as the Mormons can be. You know? I think the the Mormons have backed up uh, backed off on a lot of their policies, but they still do the same thing. They do shun their um, yeah yeah they shun, people they shun leave. yeah people who leave. Um, I'm sorry. I I think you know yes. There's a bit of a mainstream where you stop becoming like weirdo cult, and you become like well you know. It's a little quirky, but whatever, man. You know, they're you know they're good. There's a good guy. She's a she's a nice person or whatever. But you know, behind the scenes, there's a control mechanism. You know, if if you're if you know if you're Catholic and you decide to one day say I'm not going to go to church anymore, you know, the priests aren't going to say don't you know talk to Adam anymore. You know, it's like right. You just like you just stop going. You know, and they're like, oh, I miss you at church. You know, <laughs> that's all they'll say to you. <laughs> you know, uh, it's just it's it's not right, and you should be able to have that freedom to say I don't want to go and 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 not have uh, something held over your head as as that. So that's where I I still think like even the Mormon Church, they're just as guilty for that kind of stuff, and they're just become mainstream. You know, obviously. Um, they're far more accepted than probably the witnesses right now because they're just a larger organization. But um, you know, and and you know, from what I can tell, I I'm not an expert on them, you know, on Mormons, but I, they definitely have their own set of problems. So, yeah, that's true. I, I I just it's you know to me I've always felt uh, that you should be able to believe whatever you want to believe. You shouldn't be persecuted for your beliefs as long as you're harming others. Um, so, you know, I, I've told that to my family. I, you know, I don't care what you believe. It's just, I, it's not what I want to do anymore with my life. And, uh, unfortunately they couldn't come to that acceptance that, that right. was, um, it's you know, well, it, unfortunate. Yeah. I think it becomes just like a, a cultural thing, an identity thing, you know, where it's like us versus them. And so even if there's internal problems, it's like, well, we're, we're going to deal with it ourselves. We don't want to look bad to the outside world. Um, you know, you kind of like with the Mormons, especially, you know, they've got, they're really like the only primarily Anglo people who function like an ethnic group Yeah. in America. I mean, it's, it's kind of that us versus them thing. And that's probably the same with the, with the witnesses. Um, I never really saw them as particularly uh, non-mainstream, though. I know they were. They, I just kind of viewed them as other fundamentalists, I guess. I don't know. There's some weird stuff, but I haven't. Um, the general culture um, here, I haven't really felt a lot of people really thinking they're that weird, to be honest. I, I don't think you would. I mean, I, obviously, it's you know they used to go more. And back in my day, you, I literally would have to go door to door, like knocking yeah. doors. And, yeah, that's and the only thing they're really known for and, and <laughs> not liked for. You know. Yeah, because you wake up on a Sunday morning. Yeah. yeah, yeah, the Mormons do it too. Um, uh, but we, yeah, we were, you know, you, we were encouraged. You had to do this because this is like how we spread the word, and obviously that's free labor too to to uh, evangelize. Um, and you're bringing people into the church, hopefully. But that's, you know, annoying maybe at best. You know, on a Sunday morning, someone comes knocking on your door trying to talk to you about their religion. And you're just like, I'm not really that interested in that right now. You know, um, but yeah, I mean, they do seem pretty innocuous. But that's my, my issue is that on the surface, it looks like that. But underneath, um, yeah. there's, there's cool mechanisms that just don't have a place anymore. I don't believe, and uh, they should really be gone, uh, taken away. And and their their rules, just like, you know, um, uh, you know, was it uh, Christian Science that uh, they don't believe in like medical, um, mm-hmm. like interventions, stuff like that. I mean, they don't believe. You know, the witnesses don't believe in blood transfusions. I think they're they. Because of their, blood, their, their non-blood transfusions, doctors have done research and found workarounds for certain aspects of blood transfusions. Um, but, you know, there's still sometimes that, you know, a blood transfusion could save your life. And, um, and that's all based on an, a, 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 an offbeat um, um, scripture that talks about you shouldn't eat anything, uh, eat any blood strangled from an animal. 
well, technically you're not eating blood, you're not ingesting the blood using and like they used to have the they used to have the same belief about organ transplants. Because if you think of it in the same logic, an organ transplant is cannibalism. So it's just it, they've they've rescinded that side of it. It's, it's just a or, weird interpretation of yeah. the Bible verse. Yeah. Right. So, okay. it, it, I mean, if you go into the histories of Jehovah's Witnesses, and I mean, you'd really, you'd find tons of weird belief system that was put on people. They upheld it. And then, you know, maybe 15, 20 years later, they said, yeah, that's not a thing anymore. And they try to like bury it now. And, and the strange thing now is that, you know, they've been known for obviously their magazines and their books and all those things were printed for years. Nowadays, everything's on a, uh, they use digital. So here's this thing. I never considered this before, but like digital, like um, books and anything that you get, things can be redacted without you even knowing. When you have a book, when you have a book, it's physically there. You know that this was written in here. That's the problem I always worry about, like like uh, digital books, is that, you know, someday somebody would be like, we don't want people learning about that, so let's get rid of that. Mm-hmm. Or, or it's, it's, And, you know, who knows, you know, if there would ever be some overlord on publish, book publishing, maybe Amazon or something like that. But the witnesses definitely have done this now because they've digitized all their past books and all their old articles, but they've redacted things that don't jive with their <laughs> faith anymore unless you have the physical copies of those books you won't you won't see those so so that's weird well Aaron, <laughs> this has been awesome man thank you for coming on the show thank you for sharing all this with us um absolutely where can people um find return snake land where can people uh contact you where can they see some of your other artwork um, so Return to Snake Land is just go to uh, Return Snake Land uh, um, and you can order right on the website uh, right there. So if you do want a book, let us know. Um, I'm uh, you can find me on Twitter. I'm at uh, Blackbird uh, 2004. Uh, Jason is on Twitter too. He's on he's at Fictional Mixtape. Uh, that's his Twitter handle, and. Um, Let's see. Uh, in my artwork, you can see I have a Tumblr, uh, Tumblr page, uh, Tumblr uh, Aaron O'Brien, and I have stuff there as well. So um, definitely contact me if you wanted to see some me to do some artwork. Um, if you want to talk about Joe's Witnesses or uh, Snake Land or I guess satanic '80s stuff. <laughs> <laughs> cool. <laughs> satanic '80s stuff is always fun. <laughs> yes, of course. Yeah, no, no, it's all fun, but yeah, some some stuff is more fun than others. Yeah, yeah. Well, guys, I I really appreciate that awesome. you had me on the show. I, I, like I said, been a big fan of your show for a long time, and this is this has yeah. been a blast. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, stay on the line for us. We're going to close out this segment, and guys, we'll be back on Conspiracy Normal. To Conspira Normal, we're just going to go ahead and start recording. Uh, on the line, we got Mr. Phil Buck. What's up, man? He's from uh, originally from Memphis, Tennessee, correct? That is correct. Yeah, I grew up yeah. in Memphis. Lived in Nashville for a long time, and he's kind of a Tennessee boy. Yeah. yeah. He's kind of a Renaissance man. He's a. a we're talking to him today about a, a comic book he he helped create called the shadow people uh it's also a, a musical project because he's a musician as well and a uh, uh kind of like a meme lord comedian right <laughs> uh yeah i appreciate that i don't self-subscribe the term meme lord <laughs> but um yeah i mean i definitely went into that world in the last like year or two so that's i guess that's where i met more than comic books is the comedy slash meme world that's fair but yeah, I mean, I did uh, work for a long time on a comic book called Those Shadow People, and it's it's a little bit on a hiatus, but there's a lot of stuff out there that people have probably not discovered, so I'm super thrilled to be on the podcast for you know the reasons that your audience would probably enjoy the content, I'm hoping. 
I mean, yeah. being optimistic here. Well, with a name like those shadow people, that is reminiscent of the shadow per person phenomenon. So that's a little supernatural. <laughs> it's definitely supernatural. I mean, it's it's psychological. I mean, there's a little bit of the superhero aesthetic in the like character design, but I mean, more than anything, I feel like the whole book and the story is based upon the idea of of you know, th there's a lot of different theories about shadow people out there that you guys could probably enlighten me a lot more than I even know. But you know, the idea I was playing with for this comic book was that like, okay, so there are shadow people. Um, they exist in our world, and they are based on uh, other people's experiences. You know, people experience shadow people in their own, you know, uh, in their own experience, right? They see them ha for whatever reason they may have. It can be a lot of different reasons. But I thought it was interesting, the idea that, like, this psychological element was not only the reason people experience shadow people, but it was actually the, like, genesis of the shadow people. Like, those shadow people exist because these people had these ideas and these, you know, they were imagining those shadow people, and that brought these things to life. And that's where the whole comic book kind of, like, you know, spins off from. So what's kind of this, the general cosmology of the comic book? So this takes place in, in a world that where there's like a there's two worlds, right? There's a shadow realm and the light realm. Absolutely. Yeah, this is basic idea. You know, in, in a book like this, you call one world the shadow world and the light world. But the light world is just our world. It's Earth. And and the shadow realm is kind of this other metaphysical, like in between space where, you know, people's. Uh, ideas or maybe their shadow selves like their idea of themselves their ego uh, they come to life in a in an actual physical space that exists between our world and and, and other worlds I guess and uh, you know they're basically uh, existing in another way in another dimension and they sometimes interact with each other which is kind of the interesting part where did the uh, where did like the inspiration for some of this stuff come from is it kind of the psychological aspect is like those like the the Jungian ideas of like the shadow and maybe like yeah. different components to the soul and stuff like that yeah absolutely it's funny that you would ask that about you know Jungian and I've actually looked at a lot of just like diagrams of the theories you know that Jung had about the uh, the entire you know ego id super all that and i've just and i've overlaid that on ideas for the story so the narrative and then like even song lyrics and stuff like i've used those to create these weird maps of like ideas and and themes and so yeah that's definitely a big part of it and it just goes back to the fact that you know this originally was a musical project and we wanted to represent this music um in a way that we couldn't do it was a bunch of people that were not in the same space so we couldn't do it in a traditional way like we couldn't have a band so we thought well what are we going to do to represent these you know musicians these personalities and and give them a life somewhere uh if it can't be on a stage well where could it be and it was like you know originally we thought about doing some like you know really elaborate animation music videos but we couldn't quite reach that so we decided comic books could be interesting because we could use the comic book format to you know combine that with a, a record release so we were going to do this thing with a record and a comic book and so we decided to explore the ideas like well, what can we do with a comic book and we took our own ideas of ourselves as you know with these uh, shadow cells uh, representing the musical ideas and just kind of let uh, writers and artists like kind of just go where wherever they thought it could go <laughs> that's cool how many people in total are involved in in both projects oh my god uh that's a really good question i i think it's probably somewhere around 10 to 15 in total wow. you know so, <laughs> yeah, lot, yeah. Huh? it's ridiculous but that's the beauty of our you know the age we live is that we have the internet so Anybody that kind of knows what they're doing with their instrument and microphone and, uh, you know, a digital audio workstation can get in there. That's kind of where, it, you know, literally uh, we had like a Google document and everybody would type in this thing with like different colors uh, to represent, you know, who was talking because 
at any time you'd sign in and you didn't know who had updated this thing. And so I think I was blue and somebody else would be purple and so forth and so on. But yeah, it was just like anyone felt like they had the skills and the, you know, talent. Uh, we just let them come in and, and it was both extremely experimental in a good and a bad way. Cause at the end of the day, you didn't really know what you're going to end up with. How many people had their hands in, the, in both? I mean, obviously you did, but how many people were both working on music and had either writing or artistic capacity in the in the comic? Well, you know, that's actually a much smaller Venn diagram. There was really myself, I was like the connective tissue yeah. of the comic books and the, you know, music. Um, I don't think a ton of other people were trying to do the comic book side. Uh it was really, I was the one finding the, the way to connect those two things. You know, there was like probably 10 people that were musicians or writers. Um, I myself was writing stories as, you know, like a comic book script. And then, you know, I did kind of like parse these ideas out with my closest friend, Tim Santos, uh, that was also um, one of the main contributing musicians. I feel like Will. Did you ever work with Tim as well? Like back in the day. Yeah, yeah. I okay. Think we, I think we did some collaborative stuff through the uh, Battle of the Beat stuff. Oh yeah, and and through some of your bands too. That makes a lot of sense now. Of course. Um, so yeah, Tim is one of the guys that's always been you know the sounding board for you know well, both of us have been sounding boards for each other to just like talk about weird ideas and work them out and he um, helped me write a lot of the concepts but I was the one that kind of sat down and wrote scripts and uh, it's weird man it's like when I'm talking to you guys right now there's there's like five issues of this comic book out there and the comic book world is so dense it's hard to 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 get your material out there I literally have like six or seven more comic book scripts written for this world that I have not been able to like execute yet <laughs> which is just you know crazy to me like i spent a lot of time writing uh, and they they the hardest part was that they are all based off of the musical ideas you know i was trying to find a way to interpret the themes of the music uh into a literal narrative you know so somebody could sit there and you could talk about and you know, there's this song called beyond these walls and it's about how these shadow people in the in the shadow realm are you know, they're actually locked up by this tyrant like he's closed down the city and uh you know almost every song if you go on uh like spotify just search for those shadow people every song is directly related to the comic book some of them are more obtuse uh but you know almost all of them correct uh connect directly to to the comic book story Cool. So, what is what is kind of the basic? Uh, what, what's the basic story uh, that happens in this these two worlds? So, I mean, just to give like a, I guess like the elevator pitch would be like, uh, it's it's funny now because so much time has gone by. It's almost like I can compare it to a newer piece of art that uh, that wasn't around when I started this. But like, y'all, did y'all see Ant Man, the movie with Paul Rudd and? Evangeline. I haven't seen either of them, but I'm aware of the plot, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, uh, it's basically like, yeah, there's this guy, uh, scientist, old guy that's been doing research all his life, and his daughter kind of stumbles upon it and falls into his world, um, which is, you know, the shadow realm, which is uh, he's been trying to exploit another dimension for nefarious reasons. Like, he wants to use dark matter. He wants to use exotic uh you know, materials of our world and exploit them to create energy and all kinds of just, you know, it's all for profit for him. You know, he's not really thinking about anybody's well-being. Um, and he's always kind of kept this secret. Like, his daughter doesn't really know what he does. But, you know, basically going to the shadow realm and getting to know these shadow people. And so, on the flip side, uh, the story also explores the characters in the shadow realm. And these characters in the shadow realm are all based off people in in our world and those people are fighting a much bigger like a literal like lord of the Rings style battle um uh, just to you know uh, basically be free and live a good life because um it's the world the shadow realm is a world of like 
potential like imagination can basically control energy and these people can just like you know take very little effort to become very powerful and so they've you know created a major conflict and uh the daughter her name is sarah uh kind of falls into this over the four issues that you can read online you'll kind of see how she gets involved in all this and I hate to say it, we're kind of at a hiatus right now. So if anybody does go online and check it out and you like it, you know, um, at least send me an email, maybe pick up a, a copy because we'd love to pick it up. But uh, we kind of took a pause because it's uh, it's hard to make comics, man. I need some I need some folks to like read it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How long ago? Well, how long ago did you do it? How long has it been? The span, uh, most active span was running from like 2012 to 2018. Um, 2019 was a very busy year, but everything that we did for the project has not come up yet. And it's kind of, like I said, it's kind of on a, a hiatus right now just because we're formulating the next steps. Um, I do have probably the most generous offering of music that we've ever created. Uh, I've got about 11 songs. Uh, for an album called, um, what is it called? From, let's see, from the Blo- from the void and into oblivion. And the idea is just that you're just kind of existing in a blip of time. You know, you kind of come from nothing and go back to nothing. Um, and then instead of comic books, I actually started working with a lot of the artists that helped me make the comics to start storyboarding and designing scenes for more of the original. Uh, hope which was that we were going to do these animated you know music videos so a lot of that stuff has been made and it's just kind of hanging out in in process um but yeah i would say 2018 was the last year you saw a big um release which was actually this prequel comic it's about the main character uh, his name is dr biao and so we put out a, a, a whole album of instrumental music for dr biao uh, and like an origin comic, which you guys, if anybody listening is interested, I would say check that out because it's probably one of the best things that we've done. Both music and and the comic book production are both really on point, and it and it works really well if you just kind of read them together. Like, yeah, you, you can does. take take on both of those at the same time because the music for this one, the Doctor Yao has no uh, instrumentals, so it's kind of nice. You can easily like read a comic book to that type of music. Cool. And can you kind of ex- explain the the kind of style of the music to people? What what they can expect? Or? Absolutely. Um, it kind of ranges depending on like. So we just talked about Doctor Biao. Um, I guess I should say it's kind of funny what we did there is that we took some of the characters and let them become like their own side project. So like those shadow people would be like the X Men, whereas Doctor Biao would be like professor x you know what i'm saying yeah, it's like a solo joint <laughs> absolutely we try to take that literally to a certain degree like we also have another project for the antagonist which is uh, black candle and you can hear uh, black candles music on spotify individually just like dr bial is on there individually and they have their own little spinoff comics um, so each one of these projects does have kind of their own sound and the one we were just speaking of dr bial has more of a like a synth rock sound, so kind of an 80s based synth with uh, some nice. pretty heavy, heavy psychedelic guitars in there in the mix. Um, Black Candle um, was more of a kind of a pop uh, soul sound. And then the those Shadow People itself, I would kind of categorize as like dark soul, uh, if that makes any sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, they should definitely go check it out to get, to get a sense of that. Um, it's just so cool because, like, in the spirit of a lot of great sci-fi, you know, epic sci-fi stuff, you've created this this whole world. Yeah, that was definitely the idea. Was um, the the world was probably there even before we drilled down and made you know comics and music. We you know we had this giant map that you can see <laughs> uh, of the shadow realm, and you know um, we definitely have tried to develop the lore as well that goes along with that world. But what's that like to feel like you've like you like a a god or something? <laughs> you made this like whole whole other world, and you get to like you know just write out the story and all these characters, and it's it's pretty cool, man. Yeah, I agree with you. I think it's a, a very 
um, rewarding process to go through. I think if nothing else, it helped me learn a lot about storytelling and production of both music and comics and printing. And I mean, God, everything you can think of. Um, I think in my mind, and maybe it'll be inspiration to anybody else out there that's listening that wants to do this kind of thing, is that you kind of think that if you create this big world, it gives like a space for somebody else to go into and like really just, you know, immerse themselves in your ideas. Um, And I think at the end of the day, the world is really saturated with art and a lot of really, really good art, like a lot of really good sci-fi and a lot of really good just, you know, fiction. And so you have to kind of like, I think you have to take it with a grain of salt that like if you want to do that type of thing and you want to do a world building experience for, you know, um, somebody partake in, you know, really drill down, like, you know, spend your time doing that, build the world, make like an encyclopedia for your world, spend your time doing that. But at the end of the day, focus on like the story that is going to carry the people through that world because like nobody really cares how much effort you put into like building a world if there's not a story that like takes them through it. You're yeah. saying like if you have these buzzwords or this like encyclopedia of things that are meaningful, uh, you know, most of the time those things are not going to be super important to the reader. And that's, I guess what I've learned is that like I visualize this kind of metaphysical journey that I would, think my listeners or readers could go through but like most people don't actually have that much time to invest in it and it's like you still got to get them in the same place that they came from when they sit down on their phone or on their netflix you know what i'm saying like (laughs) yeah and they relate to characters more than anything absolutely man and i mean it's like i relate to a lot of stuff like i don't know if you guys watch the show on netflix like dark Um, it's a great show love it and it's one that inspires me greatly because they do that very subtle you know extremely uh heavily character based narrative but um very well built world um you know as far as like there's a lot of time travel well it's it's all time travel (laughs) yeah it's a weird it's a weird one but it's it's very well done yeah i agree yeah, that's all I was going to say, too, is that it's very well done. And it's like that kind of thing is kind of what I was hoping to achieve with those shadow people. So maybe if nothing else, if people are trying to figure out if I would like this, you know, from this interview, uh, if you like Dark, then give those shadow people a chance. I mean, I am not on the budget of a Netflix uh, show, but, you know, I'm definitely not yet. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> maybe one day we'll see. But, yeah, I mean, I think that it's coming from that place of, like, yeah, I want to take you through some really weird shit that's been thought out from the get-go. You know, the story does span, like, 30 years um, so far. And uh, some of the books that I have written that haven't come out yet, you know, it's, like, one thing I really enjoy doing is, like, those time jumps where, where, um, I don't know if you guys ever watched, like, Reboot, um, that CGI show back in the 90s or... Young Justice, uh, which is like a DC cartoon, but they both employ these things where it's like a season ends and the show comes back and it's like five years later. And I think that's super interesting that you just, you know, can kind of leave that span of time uh, behind and just pick up in a whole new, you know, experience for these characters. And that's something that I have worked on that, you know, I haven't got to. Uh, execute yet so the, it's, it's a big story and if you like those kind of things like dark and the other that i just named like i think you know those shadow people might have something to offer for you how, how many issues are, have there been so far um technically right now there's like five and a half so there's like four issues of the main series so you can see uh those shadow people issue one through four um, we have like a web comic version and you can just see that at thoseshadowpeople.com. And then we also made like two spin-off comics. Um, like I was telling you guys about Dr. Biao is one of the characters, which is just spelled B-Y-O-W. It sounds weird, but it's just it's like meow with a B. Um and then black <laughs> candle. It's actually supposed to be like a like a onomatopoeia sound, like a synth uh, like a like a synthesizer, you know, when you play yeah. Like, yup, 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 yup. yeah, exactly. <laughs> So both of those characters have like their own comic as well. So I wouldn't include them, but yeah, there's even more like auxiliary material to explore about these characters. 
That's cool, man. What uh, something we've been kind of uh, talking about exploring lately is the is music and the paranormal or the spiritual world and things like that. Do you have any uh, do you have any insights into that, or maybe you know where inspiration comes from and all these kind of things? Well, I personally feel like a lot of paranormal experiences probably originate from your own, you know. Uh, subjective experience and and the and the unknown that you can't probably define but like yeah so many things about music and art you know put you into those spaces where you become more receptive to the the things that you can't understand so i mean <laughs> without you know like revealing too much about my own life experience i would say that yeah i mean i've had a ton of experiences with uh, musical, uh, whether it be in my own house or at a concert, that have opened me up to those kind of paranormal things that I wouldn't know at the end of the day, you know, what was real or what wasn't. But yeah, I definitely, I definitely believe that music and art can do music, especially, but music and art can definitely get you to those places. Uh, and I would encourage people to do that <laughs> as often as possible, especially in these men. Yeah, people need people need some escape. They need some connection. Well, hey, uh, thanks a lot for coming on, Phil. Adam, do you want anything else you want to add? Well, I'd, I'd like to add that uh, Phil is the one responsible for our logos. Yeah, yeah, the 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 Bigfoot and the uh, the skull, and now our little vibe and alien that we got. <laughs> and uh, Phil also worked on the uh, strange re- the new Strange Realities logo. Yeah, and that's all. Straight from uh, my comic book activities, you know, uh, being able to work with artists that uh, I met through uh, making comics has helped me be able to execute those things for you guys. So it's a super pleasure for me to be able to do that. Awesome. Awesome. All right, Phil, uh, tell everybody real quick where they can get in touch with you. Do you have a, like a web presence that people can yeah, want to see what you're absolutely. doing? Absolutely. Um, if you guys want to keep up with me specifically, um, you can see some of my kind of different stuff from what we talked about um, online at uh, juicymain.com or nematoderecords.com nematode like a uh, basically like a little worm or tapeworm order and you can also uh, look up those shadow people at just those shadow people.com to see the comics and hear the music all right awesome well cool. phil uh, stay with us we're going to close the show out do you mind uh we're, we're just going to close this show out here sir phil if that's cool uh, yeah. All right. So, guys, they've listened to Conspira Normal. As always, the usual spiel patreon.com, Conspira Normal. You can get um, episodes, extra episodes now for as little as a dollar. Uh, those are going up every week, people, so don't miss out on that. Plus, you've got at least over 30 episodes of shorter episodes, but uh, lots there on that Patreon page for you to take advantage of. Um, also, YouTube, Conspiracy Normal Podcast. And also, guys, don't forget about the Strange Realities Conference. And, Sir Phil, you can tell people when that's going to be and where. That is going to be September 25th and 26th. September 25th and 26th. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. At SIR National. And uh, we are doing a dinner on the Friday night of the 25th. Uh, and there will be a dinner with some presentations, and then on 26th will be all day of presentations. So we'd like to see you there. Hopefully all this will clear up then, (laughs) and uh, everyone will be well, and uh, the economy will be functioning enough for everybody to want to take vacations. Yep, come to Nashville. Come see us September 25th through the 26th. we got some great presentations. All right, that's it, guys. Thank you, and we'll be uh, coming back at you next week on another episode of Conspiranormal. All right. Hell yeah.
or leave a one-time donation at conspiranormal.com. And please check out our YouTube channel, Conspiranormal Podcast.